Um, so it's extra special being here in Toronto talking about AI because Toronto is like ground zero for the artificial intelligence revolution or renaissance happening in this world. Um, so it feels extra awesome to be on the stage. I'm also seven months pregnant with a baby girl called Luna. Um, <laughs> I know this conference is all about moonshots, so it feels extra appropriate that this is her name and she's my little moonshot. Um, so before we get started, I just want to share a little bit about my background and why I care so much about this topic and why we care so much about this topic at Fetch. So most of my professional experience has been in white male dominated fields. Investment banking, investment management, and high tech startups. So I know what it feels like to be the only woman in the room. It's a really lonely place. And I know what it feels like to look up and see no one that looks like me and to wonder if there's a path forward for myself. And I think that's pretty sad and I think we can do better. So today I want to talk about um, a couple of things. So one, why diversity matters so much. Two, I want to talk about what holds us back from building diverse teams. And three, make some suggestions about what we can do and how AI can help. Okay, so just a little bit about my company and, and why, you know, how it informs our perspective. So since we launched, we worked with about 450 companies, actually closer to 500, ranging from stealth mode startups to the Fortune 500, with everything in between, on every kernel imaginable in every industry. So we've seen a lot of different recruiting processes, and we've also scaled our own team using our own technology to about 240 people. So we've learned a lot along the way, and I'll try and share some of those perspectives. And basically what we do is just combine AI uh, with the human touch to help companies fill open positions really quickly. And we also help a couple of companies specifically on their diversity initiatives. Okay, I always like to start presentations with this guy. One, because I just think it's funny. Um, and two, because I think it gives a sense for the industry that we operate in. So we're creating an industry that people love to hate. Um, for a number of reasons, perhaps because the recruiting feels so unfair, and for a whole host of other reasons. Um, so, despite the fact that this industry has incredibly low customer satisfaction rates, um, it's an industry that continues to thrive. So, it's a $120 billion industry growing 8% annually. And this is because recruiting isn't a core competency of most companies. And we want to change that. We think recruiting and retaining talent and nurturing talent is perhaps the most important job that we all have. Okay, so I think we can all agree that diverse teams are simply better and that it would be a friendlier place to, you know, world to live in if we were more accepting of people of unique backgrounds. Um, but I want to make a case specifically to this room, a room of innovators, creators, um, folks who are working at startups, entrepreneurs, that diversity is actually imperative if you want to be innovative, if you want to disrupt markets, and if you want to tackle the world's toughest problems. And there's also a financial case for diversity that all about, you know, don't take my word for it, I'll share a few data points from our friends at McKinsey and UCG and Harvard. Okay, so employees and firms with two forms of diversity, so inherent and acquired diversity, are 70% likely, more likely to report that they captured in the new market. And inherent diversity, these are like the inherent traits we have, like our gender, like our sexual orientation. And acquired diversity is more like our work experience or our life experiences that we went to a Okay, gender diversity in management teams improves profitability. Diverse teams are 21% more likely to have above average returns. And diverse management teams produce more revenue due to innovation. We'll talk a little bit about why. Okay, so this is why. <laughs> um, diverse teams challenge assumptions. Think about diversity as like, or diverse teams as being like the opposite of group thing. They process facts more carefully. Um, what's interesting is diverse teams report that they're actually more uncomfortable in the team setting than being with a team of like-minded individuals, and that discomfort leads us to be a little bit more careful about the assumptions that we're making. And lastly, uh, they benefit from the wisdom of crowds. So we come up with much more creative solutions when we all bring our diverse backgrounds and experiences and insights to the table. So, if we can all say, like, diversity really, really, really matters, why do we not see more of it? So, in the next slide, I'm going to show a clip that's uh, of one of my favorite actresses, Anne Hathaway, talking really vulnerably about bias. And let's hope this works. I am, to this day, scared that the reason I didn't trust her the way I trust some of the other directors at work is because she's a woman. Wow. I'm it's so hard to admit. It's so hard to admit, and I hope people understand that, that it's hard to admit. 
I'm so scared that I treated her with internalized misogyny. Oops. Okay, so recognizing that we're all biased um, is really, really hard to admit. And if you think that you're not biased, I encourage you to go to the site <coughs> listed.harvard.edu to learn about your own biases. And let me share, actually, let me take a step backward. Bias and implicit bias and, and unconscious bias is this like hidden culprit. This is what's keeping us back from building diverse teams. So it's not only enough for us to be aware about it, we need to do something about it. So fast forward. So if you want to learn about your own biases, it's extremely humbling. Go to implicit.harvard.edu. And I'll share a little secret. I consider myself a femi feminist, and I am biased against women. And most feminists are biased against women. Most people of color are biased against people of color. This is just our natural part of wiring, but we can do better. And then, so this is an article that came out last April in Scientific American, and it basically looked at 10 years of data and said that our opinions about certain uh, social groups actually have evolved and become kinder and more welcoming over time. So these biases are not intractable. We can do something about them, and we as humans can evolve and change over time, which I think is really helpful. Okay, so let's talk about some of the most common forms of biases that uh, tend to creep up into the hiring process. Who here has heard of the affinity bias or homophily bias? Okay, this is a pesky one. Um, so this is our tendency to be drawn to candidates that look and sound and have similar backgrounds to ourselves. And oftentimes this bias is masked in the form of culture fit. So um, culture fit is really problematic. Um, an example of this is, is this um, interview question called the Peter Test. Who knows what I'm talking about? Okay, I hate this question. So this question is like, do you want to have beer with this candidate? So this question tells you very little. Like, it's like, do you like this person? And it is problematic in so many ways. So my recommendation, completely throw it out. I also recommend that you completely throw out the notion of culture fit because of similar problematic reasons. Instead, consider culture out and ask yourself these two questions. One, will this candidate add to the culture of your organization rather than fit it? Two, are the values aligned with the values of your organization? Okay, the next bias that we often see is halo bias. So this bias is like, oh, this candidate uh, went to Stanford or Harvard, or oh, they went to Google, Facebook, Apple. So everything else they must have done in their career must be fabulous, and we are blinded because of this halo effect. And the way that you combat this bias, I think, or one of the ways, is um, by predefining the criteria in advance of the interview that's important to you. And write it down. And have scorecards so that you go into the interview and rather than rely on your cognitive shortcuts or your assumptions about someone, inquire about these things that really matter. Okay, last thing is confirmation bias. And this is effectively when you walk into a room and make a snap judgment about someone. And then you use the rest of the interview to look for signs and signals that confirm the snap judgment that you made in the first place. This is not good, and this is extremely common. Um, so how do you address this? The thing I mentioned about uh, identifying the criteria in advance and having scorecards, that's helpful. But also just think about slowing down. Engage your system to slow thinking. If you made that snap judgment in the beginning, look for signs that actually contradict that. And think carefully about just the assumptions that you're making through the process. Okay, so now that you're familiar with the three most common forms of bias and how they enter the, the uh, interview and recruiting process, um, let's talk about what you do about them. So one, awareness, but we've talked about that not being enough. Two, removing the shame so that we can actually move forward in this discussion, and that's really important. And three, I say implementing systems and processes that will help us address bias, and this is where AI can be super helpful. Okay, so AI can help reduce bias, but it can also bake in and scale bias really efficiently. So this is a great quote that can capture it. If you train a computer to optimize outcomes using biased past decisions, it'll do a fantastic job of replicating that bias. And the issue is here that the underlying data is usually the source of the bias, not the algorithms themselves. Algorithms aren't inherently biased unless we you know, design them to be. So, um, the way I think about this is junk in, junk out. So if the data that you're using to train systems has years and years of built-in uh, biases and unfair views or bad decision-making, 
you're going to get that in the outcomes. And what do you do about this? Our view is human oversight can be really helpful. So you need humans to actually have a thoughtful look at the data that you're using to train these models and the outcomes to make sure that the outcomes are aligning with the values that you're trying to promote. Bonus points if these teams that are overseeing these models are actually diverse because they'll be more likely to be able to pick up on the problems in the first place. Okay, so I'm going to close out this talk by highlighting three things that are three hopefully tactical ideas that you can bring back to your organization related to how AI can really help. Okay, one candidate discovery. So some of you may be sitting in this audience thinking about your, uh, your own organizations and believing that maybe you need to add some diversity. So what's awesome about AI or machine learning or whatever we want to call it is that we can go out and look for diverse candidates at scale in a way that was cost prohibitive in the past or time consuming in the past. So you might say, you know what, I, I need more female engineers. And then AI can quickly build a pipeline of diverse candidates at like a 20x cost advantage. So that's pretty cool. Number two, algorithmic selection. So we talked about some of those biases that we all know we have. The issue with human selection is that these selection criteria are pretty invisible. So I might go into the interview process as a human and be judging someone based on what they look like or how they, all these other things. And we don't want that criteria in the selection process. And algorithms, you know, you're, you're aware of the criteria you're using. There's an element of this that's actually really exciting to me as well, um, that's um, looking for other proxies of competency beyond these traditional proxies that we've all relied on that are really biased for And let me explain what I mean by that. So oftentimes a company that comes to us and say, send me a pipeline of candidates that's all top 20 engineers, engineers from top 20 universities. But we know that those uh, groups of, of individuals might not be very diverse to start with. What if we looked for other, other signals of competency? And something we like to look for is career progression. How quickly did a candidate um, move through their career at different organizations? And that might tell us something about their competency that's way more valuable than educational background or work experience. Lastly, and this is kind of the least sexy as it relates to AI, but automated outreach. Um, I actually think it's probably the most impactful today. So if you let a machine go out and reach out to candidates on your behalf via your own email account, um, it can cast a much wider net than if you're manually selecting each and every candidate that you're reaching out to, not to mention the time savings of letting a machine do this. So when you actually let a machine take over this task, it can uh, cast a much wider net than you would naturally as a human being, and you can find that needle in a haystack diverse candidate that might otherwise be overlooked. And that's pretty cool. So to close things out, so um, my belief is that if we embrace diversity, and we truly believe that it really, really matters. And we embrace the tools that allow us to um, combat bias where it's most likely to be problematic. We can build work workplaces that are not only more innovative, they're more creative, they're also happy. And I think that's a, a world we can all be excited about. Thank you so much. <laughs>